We have reached chapter 11 of John as we work our way through the book. I'll just be using six verses this morning after we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, this marvelous gospel account is now getting even greater and greater as we move toward the end of this, this great book. And you're telling us a lot of important things here this morning and we ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten them for us. Your word is truth. And we need that truth in our life. We need you to work in a mighty way. It's time for us to stand up for Jesus. To let the world know that we belong to him and that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Father, be with us now encouraging us, opening our hearts, our ears, and our eyes to your word and the truth of it. We want it to change us from the inside out. We know, Father, what's in our heart will come out in our life and in our mouth. Let our heart be filled with your word and our love for you. And I pray in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John 11, beginning at chapter, uh, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. I know that we all know where this is going. It's going to go over to Bethany, but not this morning because there's so much in these verses that we need to look at. But I think before we get into chapter 11, we need to look back to help our understanding a little bit. We need to look back at the earlier chapters, those 10 chapters that we worked our way through over this past year or so. Jesus began his ministry, his public ministry there in, the, in the Cana at the wedding feast. There were a number of guests there. Now I want you to notice from the beginning of this gospel account, Jesus continually moves to a larger circle of people. There at the wedding feast, there was a good crowd, I'm sure, but relatively small as you move forward. Now, as we move forward to what we've been covering in the last couple of weeks, we know that when Jesus came to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, the whole nation was there before Jesus. He had gone from the small crowd at the wedding feast to a large crowd there in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the religious leaders too. But something happened there. The Lord Jesus Christ appearing to the nation, giving them the truth, he presented himself and they rejected him. At first, we need to look, his works were rejected. John 5, 16 says, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. They didn't worry about the miracle. He did it on the Sabbath. His works are rejected. Then we find the words of Jesus are rejected in chapter 8, verses 58 and 59. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And then we saw in the last chapter, chapter 10, that the person of Jesus Christ was rejected. I and my Father are one. And the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So now, as we come into chapter 11, there is a little change of pace. There's a pause here, if you will. Because of rejection of the nation of a whole, as a whole to Jesus, his public ministry is over. His ministry now is geared to more of a private ministry. 
Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Jesus ever stopped preaching. He didn't. He never stopped teaching. He never stopped performing miracles. But at this point, he is beginning to center himself on individuals, smaller groups again, the people who hear his voice and know him. He no longer at this point reaches out to the nation as a whole. Now the things that occur in chapter 11 of John occur between the Feast of Dedication, that Hanukkah feast, and Passover. It's about a four month span here. Jesus is heading to the cross. He's taking the last steps now. He's on the other side of the river. Remember we're told that He went the other side of the Jordan where John baptized. He's left Judea. He's over there now. Now, as I said, when you read this wonderful Gospel account, it's kind of like hiking. And you keep getting higher and higher and you think that you can, you can see the top. It's hidden in clouds. If you haven't ever read this book, if it was all new to you, you would just keep reaching forward wanting to get to the summit. And we're beginning to get there now. But it's important for us to remember, every one of you to remember, why John wrote this Gospel account. You have to go over to chapter 20 for that. And John says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the things that are written here, are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. That's the reason John wrote this Gospel. He was inspired to write some of the events of Jesus' life so that you would believe. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's how He began this book. And then He told us, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And while our Lord walked among us in the flesh, this great truth was continually confirmed. He is the Word in flesh. By the miracles that He performed, the parables that He spoke, the teaching that He gave, and those miracles, oh! You know, He taught like no other man. He spoke like no other man. The question which everyone asked, and it's a very important one, can Jesus raise the dead? That's an important question. You can absolutely be sure that any religion, including the false religions of this world, and there are many of them, the biggest question that they have, or the people in those congregations that are listening, have, concerns death. What happens afterward? You know, that's one of the great questions that people want to ask. Without a doubt, death is a great mystery. But I want to tell you something else. This life is a great mystery too, isn't it? But I want to tell you something. This life that we live right now is meaningless if there's no resurrection of the dead. It's meaningless. No resurrection means you have nothing to look forward to. There's nothing beyond this short, pain-filled, trouble-filled life. Death will just end it all, just cease to exist. That's a sad thought, isn't it? So the major question to ask any religion is whether or not it has the power over death. Does that, your belief system have the power over death? I know I've mentioned that the liberal theologians disregarded miracles a long, long time ago. And they will tell you straight out, there's nothing miraculous in the Bible. They must read a different Bible than I read. I don't know. The Bible is, from, is a miracle from page one when God created the heavens and the earth. It's miracle after miracle after miracle. But you see, they don't do this for a scholarly reason. They say it and teach it for one reason, one reason only. They don't believe in the miraculous. Just like the Sadducees didn't believe in a the resurrection. <coughs> they had no reason for it. They just believed that. Now let's, uh, let me just shorten that sentence a little bit for them. The liberal theologians, they just don't believe. There it is. If you don't believe, you're not going to believe in anything. You're not going to believe in the miracles of the Bible. <coughs> they place limits on God. Wow. They place limits on a God that we're told with all things are possible. They place limits on a God who said there's nothing too hard for the Lord. They believe some little, in some little, puny, powerless God 
of their own invention. They believe in a God that they can twist and turn and move the way they want Him to move. They believe in a God that, that changes what He says today for something else tomorrow. They believe in a wishy-washy God. That's not the God of Scripture. There are far too many false teachers today who present an artificial doctrine that goes something like this. I believe in a religion of the here and now, not the hereafter. I don't believe in that pie in the sky religion that people talk about. I want meat and potatoes religion. I want a religion that is practical, not theoretical. Well, you know what? I want something that's practical and not theoretical too. It's Christianity. That's the wonderful thing about Christianity. It's true. It's practical and it gives us hope not only for today, but for all eternity. Belong, belonging to Jesus Christ, being saved by His blood, coming by faith to, that, to Him, means that you are given so many wonderful benefits here and now, which satisfies the here and now generation. Think of what you have. But the greatest gift of all for a born-again believer is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So it is indeed right and proper to ask the question, will the dead be raised? All I know, especially the older ones of us, I know this, life is brief. It's, it's like a vapor in the wind. Time moves so quickly. I know I've told you many times when I was growing up, my dad said, son, enjoy it. As you get older, time goes faster. And I was just, I could not understand that. I would look at my watch and a second would be a second and a minute would be a minute. But I found out it's true. The older you get, the watch may not move any faster, but your time does. So we consider our little short time in this life in comparison to eternity. Our life is nothing more than a blink of an eye. Actually, it's not even that, is it? Over the years, I've conducted some funerals, of course. There have been some for those who are not saved, but for the most part, they were professing believers who had gone on home. And when you stand at the graveside of those funerals, when you stand there with the believers, they certainly consider the resurrection to be very real and very practical. And they know without a doubt, they're going to see their loved one again. There's a difference. I'm going to tell you, the difference between standing at a graveside for a believing family and a believer who's passed and an unbeliever, it's day and night. It breaks your heart to stand at the head of that casket at the cemetery and know that that person was an unbeliever. Especially if it's a family member. And I've stood at that and know that they weren't. You stand at that graveside as an unbeliever, you have no hope. You're whistling in the dark, you're singing in the rain, you're crying the blues. You have nothing to hold on to. You have no hope. But there's one thing I've seen over the years, and that's that the cults and the religions of this world today, there are all kinds of chicanery going on, racketeering, but nobody is in the business of raising the dead. They raise money, but they don't raise the dead. I've heard of those who claim to raise the dead, but you know what? Interestingly, they never seem to produce the person they said they raised from the dead. Hmm. If you like to watch old police stories, that would mean they had no corpus delecti to prove what they did. See, when Jesus was sick, it was the body that was healed. When Je our Lord Jesus Christ raised the dead, it was the body that was raised. And when Jesus Christ raised from the dead, He rose that victorious on that Sunday morning, that resurrection Sunday, He appeared to many people, didn't He? Mary Magdalene, those on the road to Emmaus, the ten disciples in the upper room behind the locked door, mixed with the eleven. The Bible says 500 at one time. That's proof. Not like the charlatans today who say they did something, but they can't prove it. You see, also, not only were there witnesses to these events who could testify that Jesus raised people from the dead. They spoke of it. 
That's proof. And it's sad that this world today is full of false religions that promise you so much for this life. They'll tell you, and if you don't believe me, just flip the TV channel sometime. They'll tell you how to get rich. They'll tell you how to enjoy your wealth. But they don't tell you anything about the hereafter. I'm going to tell you something right now. If I could tell you how to make millions of dollars in the next week, what good would it do you if the Lord calls you home? It's not important, is it? When someone is not giving you the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're whistling in the wind. I've heard people say, I don't want to go to church. The only thing you talk about in church is Jesus. What else is there to talk about, folks? Hmm. You see, what those false religions actually do is like taking you up on a plane flight. We're going to, but you get up on that plane and you look out the window and everything's pretty, and then they announce, well, we don't have anybody to land the plane. That's what it, these religions are giving you here and now, but they don't tell you how to land in heaven. The great hope of the Christian faith is the resurrection of the dead because he lives. We can face tomorrow, as the old hymn says. He lives, we live. It's wonderful and interesting that the gospel accounts tell us of three incidents where Jesus returned someone to life. And probably more. You know, John said, not everything that Jesus did is written in this, this book. I don't know how many people Jesus will have to ask when we get to heaven how many people he may have raised from the dead. But we have three recorded. Now, Remember, we're told very little about Jesus' ministry. We're told of the 12-year-old little girl who had just died. She's a juvenile, a child. She just died. Jesus is there. Then there was a young man who had died, whose body was being carried to the cemetery. He had been dead long enough that they had prepared the body. They're heading for the tomb. He seemed like he was probably a young fellow in the prime of life. And then finally, we're told of Lazarus, and we'll be talking about Lazarus in the coming weeks, who was possibly a, a senior citizen. I don't know. He was an older man than these others. And he had been dead four days and in the tomb. Now, here's the point I make here in Scripture. All three were raised. And they were raised from every age group. They had all been dead for different lengths of time. And it was no problem for Jesus to call them back to life. Now, I want to tell you something else. These three people, we refer to them as being resurrected. They were not, this was not a resurrection. They were raised from the dead. In each case, there was a restoration of life. Now, let me give you the biblical definition of resurrection. This is it. It, speaking of the dead body, is sown in corruption. That is, it was subject to death. It, again, the body, speaking of the a bodily resurrection here, is raised in incorruption. Eternal life, it's never going to die again. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory, a glorified body. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Not a spirit body, but a body that's full of the spirit. It's a physical body. Now, not one of those three people we mentioned earlier in this gospel account were raised from the dead or given a glorified body. Once they, re they returned from the dead, they, were, they lived, they sinned, they struggled, they died again. They all faced death again. With a resurrection body, we'll never face death again. Now, here's the fact that will aid you, aid you, I think, in your thought. Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. Jesus Christ is the true resurrection. Christ, the first fruits, afterward they that are in Christ at his coming. No matter how long the body of that believing person, that believer in Jesus Christ, has been in the ground, in the tomb, in the sea, it doesn't matter. When Jesus comes back, he's going to raise them. I don't care if, if the body was burned. He's going to put those ashes back together. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. And it's going to happen in time. His, in His own order. So, 
As we read in the Bible, we clearly see that Jesus used different methods to perform His miracles of healing. The same is also true of the Lord's method of raising the dead. But there's something which the Lord did in every single case. He called them. Little girl, Lazarus, come. He called them. He called them. He spoke to them as if they heard Him. And they did. Have you ever wondered why Jesus did that? If Jesus was sitting there in that little bedroom where that little girl just died and said, rise, every person who ever died would raise from the dead. He had to be specific. When he called Lazarus back, Lazarus come forth. If he had not been specific, everyone would have come forth. And when he comes for us, he's going to call you by name. Every believer will hear their own name. I believe that. Jesus called them in a the manner because they indeed did hear Him. He called them personally and by name. And one of these days, every born again believer, when they hear that shout, that's going to be their name as they go up. And I pray that it's in my lifetime. I don't know if it will be or not, but wouldn't it be wonderful, Lord, to come back and snatch us out of here? You look at the world, I don't think it can be too much longer. I'm telling you right now. If He lives, comes back in our lifetime, it's going to be wonderful. Well, I guess uh, I better get started on our passage for today. I've kind of wandered off a little bit here. We're given some important information. In those first two verses of chapter 11, we're told that now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, town of Mary and her sister Martha, and we're told that it was that Mary which had anointed the Lord with his ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we're told right off that Bethany is the town of Mary. John wrote this somewhere around 98 AD. And by that time, you realize many people had already heard the story of her anointing his feet with that ointment. It was expensive ointment that she used. And you may not realize it, but the sweet smell of that box that she opened, that she broke open for Jesus 2,000 years ago, still fills the world today. There's a still a sweet smell because it's the Savior. You know, Jesus told Mary that her act of devotion, her act of love, will be remembered wherever the gospel message is preached. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Mary and what she did. I truly think that there are many, are going to be many humble believers for the last 2,000 years. There been many humble believers. And they've been breaking those alabaster boxes of ointment all these years. They're doing it out of love. I'm not talking about literally doing it, but you understand what I'm saying. I'm, I'm speaking of what they have done for the cause of Christ. They've done it out of love. They've done it out of devotion, just like Mary did. They're giving their best to the Lord without thinking of the physical cost to them. See, that's what she did. She didn't think about how much that cost she wanted to do something for the Lord. In other words, these people who do this, they give what's right, not what's left. So often, we have a tendency to give the Lord what we have left over rather than to give Him what is best for Him. You know, you can't outgive the Lord anyway. I don't know why we try to do it. These people who care more about the Lord, this is the kind of people they are, than for their own personal needs and finance, that is faith. And they have seen over the years that they give to the Lord and the Lord blesses them back. I want to tell you something, and I believe those people are going to have far more recognition in heaven than some of the well-known Christian leaders who receive so much publicity down here. Because God looks at the heart. We're also told that Bethany was the home of Martha. Now our Lord visited Bethany in the home of Mary and Martha before, probably on many occasions. They seemed to be close. Martha had been involved and somewhat frustrated in the preparation of the meal. 
She was so involved with the physical aspect of the meal that Jesus said, Martha, you better sit down right here at my feet and learn from me rather than being so busy in service. In short, Jesus was saying, it's easy for us to become so involved in the things of the world that we miss the opportunity to spend that, spend that special time at the feet of the Lord. Oh, what I'd love to be able to sit on the mountainside and listen to Jesus. Can you imagine sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing him? Well, you know why? People say, but Jesus is not here today. There's, and there's so many things I need to get done. But oftentimes those many things that they're talking about are worldly things, sinful things, just plain recreation, getting from, get ahead of Jesus. But I'll tell you something, Jesus is here today. And even though you cannot see Him, He's here. And you can still sit at His feet and learn from Him. You want to do it? You take your Bible, you open it, you read it, you study it. You know what? You're sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's simple. You can go to the Lord in prayer. You can share the gospel with others. You can attend church services. You can, all those things, you're sitting at the feet of the Lord. There are things that in this life we must do. And this is very important. As born again believers, Jesus must come first. If Jesus is not the center of your life, your life is not going to be smooth. It's going to bump like a tire out of balance. He's got to be the center. And that means that we have to sit at His feet as often as we possibly can. Think about that. That's a humble position to sit at someone's feet. But to sit at His feet, what a glorious position it is. As we get older, we don't hear as well as we used to. So if you sit at His feet, you're close enough to hear every single word. Read your Bibles. Hmm. You know, different people have different gifts. And we see the different gifts of Martha and Mary here. Some women are given a marvelous gift in the house. If you want to talk about women's liberation, <laughs> let me tell you something. There's, there's no one I can think of that is a bigger boss than the wife and a mother in her own home. Am I telling the truth, husbands? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, she is in control. I'm not talking about biblically. I'm talking about the way she A wife takes charge. Not only of the kitchen, but the whole house. And that's the calling of many Christian wives. And there's nothing belittling, belittling about that gift. To be able to take charge of a home, not the marriage or be the head of the husband, but fulfilling what she's supposed to be doing in the home. And there's some women who have outside ministries. But I did not say that should, they should be pastors. Don't get me started. That's not biblical. Regardless of what the liberal theologians out there say, or what the feminists might say and teach, the Bible is clear that women can have a ministry, but that position of the position of pastor is restricted to men. And that's God's plan, and it's his perfect plan. So don't shoot the messenger. That's just the way it is. But some women do have a gift to teach the Bible. They teach Bible classes to other women and to children. And women can be deeply involved in child evangelism and they can certainly work in the church in many different ways. Remember, the woman who serves in the home can be serving the Lord, and the woman who serves outside the home can be serving the Lord. The Holy Spirit bestows gifts, many types of ministries. Therefore the sister said unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him who thou lovest is sick. Mary and Martha demonstrate some humbleness here. They sent a message to Jesus, but did you notice anything about that? They didn't ask one thing of Him. They didn't say, come quickly. They didn't say, heal my brother. They just said, the one you love is sick. 
They actually make no request of Jesus whatsoever. They don't demand anything from him. What they actually do is a pretty good outline for prayer, though. The sisters simply tell Jesus the problem. What a simple thing to do. Tell the Lord your problem. They're not offering Jesus any advice. They just give him the basic facts. They let him know that he has to decide what's best. What a novel idea. Let the Lord decide what to do. Wow, who came up with that idea? Isn't it nice? You know, over the years I've heard people go to the Lord in prayer and they almost demand the Lord heal someone. They demand. It's like they're pounding their hand on the table and saying, you heal him. Well, I don't know when our Lord, our great mighty God, became a bellboy who's supposed to carry our luggage and do what he's told. I, don't, I miss that somewhere in my Bible. Anybody see that in the Bible? Did I miss it? You know, our Lord doesn't do things that way. Mary and Martha knew Jesus they do him pretty well. And that's important for us to know Jesus too. We need to know the Lord. And because they did indeed know Jesus, they simply informed him, Lord, behold, him who thou lovest is sick. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus was already aware that Lazarus was sick. Jesus knew full well that Lazarus was going to die. And Jesus knew full well he had to call Lazarus back from the grave. He is God. God knows all things. He might be walking this earth totally man, but he's still totally God. He knows all things. There's something which jumps out at me when I read this passage. He whom thou lovest. Lazarus is loved by the Savior. Over in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, He loved me. John called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Paul declared that Jesus loved, Peter declares that Jesus loves us. And by the way, Jesus loves you and Jesus loves me. Anyone who is a child of God is one whom Jesus loves. There's one more thing I want to tell you about the word love, lovest here. In the Greek, it is phileo. Basically, I put this to you, it's what? The one that you like a lot. They didn't use agape, that divine love. You see, they did not understand yet. They didn't realize the love that Jesus really has for us, that agape, that divine love, that godly love, the love we should be striving for every day. That's why we need to love God more every day. The reason you need to love your spouse more every day, you're trying to reach that level. They didn't truly understand the depth of Jesus' love for Lazarus or for themselves yet. I believe at that time, the sisters would, in time, the sisters would learn the difference. It's a learning process for them. It's a learning process for us. For us, I think it's more difficult because we, use the, we just casually toss the word love around. We need to understand what love really is. When, it, for me, it's hard to comprehend the love that Jesus has for me and for you. It's beyond anything we can really comprehend. Many times I've told you that God has a perfect time and purpose for everything He does. And this is demonstrated in verse 4. It said, when Jesus heard that, He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Remember the disciples said, who sinned that this man was blind from birth? His family, his fathers or him? For the glory of God. And here again, it's for the glory of God. That the Son of God might be glorified. That's the purpose. We know that Jesus was not in Bethany at that time. And a messenger was sent out to him. He's on the other side of the Jordan. I've heard some people say erroneously, I might add, that a Christian should never be sick. Wouldn't that be nice? But it never says that. Sickness is because of sin. Okay, Had Adam not fallen and none of his children ever fell, we wouldn't have a sin nature. We could still go see Adam, by the way, and we would never be sick. 
and all the funeral homes will be out of business, all the doctors will be out of business, all the hospitals will be out of business, but sin entered into the world. And with every generation, sickness gets worse. So yes, sickness happens. And then people say, well, is sickness the will of God? When we all get to heaven, let's get together and go ask Lazarus. Ask him that question. I have no doubt he can tell you all about it. He said, yes, sickness is for the will of God that I was raised again and people saw and believed in Jesus Christ. Sickness is not a sign that God does not love you. Ecclesiastes 9, 1 says, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteousness and the wise and their works and in the hands of God, no man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is set before him. God has a, he has a plan. And you might be laying on your back in the hospital. What is the plan, Lord? It will come clear. It might be, a, it might be today. It might be tomorrow. It might be two years, ten years down the road. Putting it plainly, you cannot tell by your circumstances or the circumstances of any person whether God loves him or not. The fact of the matter is, you don't have the right to judge. That man is, that blind man is sick because somebody said no. He's in this condition because he said no. We can't. Why do we judge like that? 1 Corinthians 4 5 says, Therefore, George, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then, the truth is out there. Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Lazarus when he was well. He loved him when he was sick. Jesus loved him when he was in the tomb. Jesus loved him. And yet, Jesus let Lazarus die. He says, Why? For the glory of God that Jesus should be glorified by that. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Here is the perfect timing of God. By the time Jesus gets to Lazarus, gets to Bethany, he'd been in the tomb four days. In other words, there's no doubt he's dead. I always remember, though, that Jesus loves you when you're sick. He loves you when you're well. He loves you at all times. You know what? You can't keep Jesus from loving you. How about that? Now, you might ask why He lets certain things happen to you. In all my wisdom, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. But I do know Jesus loves you. There's a reason, but I don't know it. There's a purpose in what God does. And God loves you whether or not you're a Christian. Do you know that? You can't keep Jesus from loving you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And no, no man has no greater love than this to give up his life to his friends. I want you to think for a moment about trying to get Jesus to stop loving you. You can't stop the sun from shining, can you? You can't. But you can get out of the sunshine. There's a possibility you can put up an umbrella to keep the sun off of you. You can put up a spiritual umbrella to keep the love of God off of you too. Many people do that. They just step right out of the love of Christ into the shadows. Because He loves us though, we can come to Him with boldness and present our problems to Him. What did Mary and Martha do? The one who, you, Lazarus, who you love is sick. They took their problems to the Lord. And boldness means freedom of speech. The freedom of opening your heart to the Lord. I don't know why we can't open our heart to Him more. He already knows what's there. He knows what we think. He knows what we feel. Why can't we just open boldly and tell Him the truth? Now, please understand that boldness does not mean that your requests can be demands of God. 
when you're in prayer life now, quit demanding of God. Make requests, yes. Lord, please save my family member. Please aid the ministry. Please strengthen our missionaries. But don't pound your, don't be like, I'm gonna show my age now. Don't be like Nikita Khrushchev, pull your shoe off and bang on the table with it. The young folks don't even know the name. But you can't do that with God. Trouble tests our faith. Trouble puts us on our knees. It takes a lot to get us on our knees. As we get older, it takes a lot to get us up off our knees. Maybe that's the Lord's way of saying you need to spend more time down there. You know, Moses cried to the Lord repeatedly when problems arose in the wilderness wanderings. You know, I feel sorry for Moses. I really do. He had a lot on his plate. Hezekiah took the threatening letter from the Assyrians. He presented it to the Lord. The disciples of John the Baptist came to the Lord with the heartbreaking news that John had been beheaded. You know, it's, it's when we're down in the valley, even in the shadow of death, that we must learn to trust the Lord. That's why we have to go through that valley. Because maybe our, our trust and our faith isn't what it should be. So He puts us in that valley so that we have nowhere to turn but to Him. God teaches us patience. Teaches us that we can rest in Him. He teaches us that He works all things well. All things. We need to look beyond the tears of this life, beyond the sorrows, beyond the trials of life, and see that God has a purpose in everything He does. It's not an accident. The greatest per purpose is to bring us to salvation. That's the reason most things will happen, is to get someone's attention. And you know, it may happen to you to get the attention of a lost person to say, look what God did in that person's life. If you're saved, the purpose could be calling you to repent because you've gotten yourself involved in some worldly sin. There's something in your life you need to get rid of. If He's calling you today, will you respond to it? Is the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart today? Will you respond? Whatever the need is, will you, are you willing to respond to what the Lord is calling you to do right now? Let us pray. Father, we've talked about resurrection. What a wonderful, wonderful hope that is. We've talked about the love of Jesus Christ for us, and that's marvelous. It's the love that, for us that took Him to the cross. It's the love for us that brought Him out of that tomb. And it's the love for His children that He's going to come back one day and just snatch us right out of this evil, wicked world. Lord, there's a purpose in all that You do. And there's a purpose for everything you've done in every life here today. And I'm asking these people here today to respond to your call. I know that we have, yeah, all of us have situations in our life, problems, worries, nothing that we can't take to you and you'll work out for us. But Father, let no one leave here today that hasn't dealt with you about their salvation who's not absolutely sure that they're saved. Let no believer leave here today until they're sure that they have repented of every sin that they should, should not have committed this week. Lord, let us respond to your calling this morning. And I pray that the Holy Spirit tugs heavily at those heartstrings. Father, I turn these requests over to you knowing that you will do what's right in every case. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, remember